Hello, my name is Karen Burns and I'm a social worker in the perinatal psychiatry department at UNC Chapel Hill. Today, I'll be presenting on perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and a statewide mental health access program called NC Maternal Mental Health Matters. NC Matters is a collaboration between UNC's School of Medicine, Duke's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. This program is supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration, HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and its contents are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of, nor an endorsement by, HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. First, a note about the term perinatal, which you will hear throughout this presentation. The prefix peri means around, so perinatal refers to the time around birth. This includes the period of pregnancy and the year following delivery. It's also important to recognize that a woman experiences a number of transitions over her lifespan, particularly hormonal transitions, but also psychological and social. Puberty, pregnancy, and perimenopause are all hormonal transitions, which have significant implications for women's health across and beyond the reproductive system. So these transitions are related to not only mood disorders, but metabolism, cardiovascular health, and autoimmune health, just to name a few. And then pregnancy in particular can be a time that is ripe for reflecting on our past, our identity, and what we want for our future. So it's a loaded time in a number of ways. Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, um, that's an umbrella term for a number of symptoms and disorders. And we often use the acronym PMADS. So patients tend to like this term PMADS because it speaks to their broader personal experience instead of categorizing them as simply depressed. Postpartum depression is well recognized at this point in our society, but many patients may say that their symptoms began during pregnancy, not postpartum or their primary feeling wasn't depression, but it was stress or anxiety. So our screening tools, such as the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, the EPDS, um, they don't necessarily capture that complexity. So for example, a mother who has distressing thoughts of dropping her baby, or a parent who feels like her emotions are very up and down and volatile. She feels irritable and reactive in a way that's maybe disturbing to her. Um, and then we have disorders such as postpartum psychosis, um, which is often considered to be a psychiatric emergency, but those symptoms and the distress that they call can they cause can also vary from patient to patient. So these are just um, categories of symptoms, but don't, don't tell the whole story. And we don't really know the true prevalence of PMADS in North Carolina and how it varies by community and by patient population. We have these general statistics from research papers, but what's most important is to recognize how common these symptoms are among perinatal patients. And um, the estimates range from one in five to one in seven perinatal patients who will experience PMADS. We want to communicate to our healthcare providers and to our legislature and to our stakeholders how important mental wellness is as part of the pregnancy and the parenting journey. PMADS are the most common complication during and after pregnancy. Specific populations are at higher risk, um, for example, pregnant teenagers or women of low socioeconomic status, um, probably due to other related stressors. The symptoms can last for about six months, but for some they can last much longer. Um, the symptoms can appear much later in the postpartum period than we expect. So for example, one of the triggers um, may be weaning from breastfeeding and some people wean when their children are two or older. So um, we would still consider that to be postpartum depression, even though it's past the one year mark following delivery, because the biological and hormonal components are similar to what we would see in depression that occurs more immediately postpartum. And this is important because sometimes mental health is a part of the prenatal care and that initial postpartum visit, but then it's never addressed again. And the fact is that postpartum women may interact with pediatricians, family medicine, internal medicine, and others well after their pregnancy and their delivery, and they may still be struggling. So primary care providers should really be aware of all of this as a possibility when they are working with new parents. Looking at the risk factors for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders really highlights the importance of whole person care. The risk factors, as you can see, are biological, they're social, they're economic, they include psychiatric history, family history, lack of a support system, living in a high conflict environment, age, and, and more. 
Um, I like to highlight here the role of medical trauma and uh, childhood or sexual trauma. So not everyone who experiences a trauma is necessarily destined to develop a mood disorder, but medical traumas can be very impactful for women and therefore must be addressed carefully. A traumatic childbirth experience, such as a miscarriage, stillbirth, infant loss, that is all incredibly stressful. Systemic racism is very stressful. People of color have reported perceived discrimination and poor communication from their healthcare providers in several studies. So all told, it's challenging to predict who will ultimately experience PMADs. Even with all of these risk factors we've known about for years, we cannot predict who will have an episode because there are so many interactions at play. What we can do is continue to think about ways to decrease risk and increase supports for women who are in our care. Surveys from the past year have shown that anxiety and depression in the general population are higher due to the pandemic. So it's not a surprise that pregnant people are feeling this way too. Families are struggling with additional financial stress, job loss, and limited access to community resources, which have resulted in an increase in domestic violence rates, for example. And we've already discussed the association between a history of trauma and PMADs. Maybe COVID isn't the immediate stressor for your patient now, but there could be other things going on in their life that um, could be causing worry. So your patient might have concerns about getting basic needs met, for example, food, housing, childcare, transportation, medical costs, relationship with the father of the baby, and so on. Um, and I also like to mention that stress might express itself in ways that wouldn't necessarily get diagnosed as a mood disorder um, or an anxiety disorder. So for example, your patient might describe physical complaints such as headaches or stomach aches, cognitive problems such as having trouble concentrating. Um, and then, you know, of course, stress around fear and worry about her health or the health of her family. She might describe changes in sleep or eating patterns, um, maybe chronic health conditions that are getting worse under stress, and then maybe increased use of alcohol, tobacco, or other substances. Just to spend a little bit more time on anxiety specifically, you can see that um, anxiety is not a heterogeneous term um, and um, treatment is different depending on what your patient is experiencing. Anxiety is often overlooked so, and um, it's actually more common than depression. A very anxious mom may not be able to step away from the baby to sleep or to shower or to eat. Maybe she's really worried that something bad is gonna happen. She may present as very frustrated or very irritable. She may express negativity, hopelessness, racing thoughts, feeling overwhelmed, thoughts of death, um, feeling like she's a burden to her family or that her baby would be better off without her. Um, a common intrusive thought for anxious women is that they might hurt their baby um, and they might not want to disclose those thoughts because they're scary or they're embarrassed. Um, they're ego dystonic, which means we know that um, they know that it is something that they don't want to do. They don't want to hurt their baby and the thoughts are really upsetting to them. Um, and all parents probably have these thoughts occasionally, um, but women with postpartum depression and anxiety, those thoughts can get stuck. Um, she might become really consumed with, you know, accidentally dropping the baby down the stairs, for example, um, and very fearful of that. An anxious mom may tell you that she wants to run away. Um, and, you know, many people have that thought when they're stressed. Um, but sometimes when someone says, I want to run away, um, I want to escape, it might be because they're not comfortable saying that they don't wanna be alive. Um, and they're worried that you'll think badly of them if they say that out loud. So as a healthcare provider, you can try to just listen, understand her experience, follow her train of thought um, and know that you should keep an eye on her. Uh, depression and anxiety like to travel together. 75% of postpartum women with generalized anxiety disorder also meet criteria for depression. Um, that's in one study. According to the DSM, postpartum depression has the same symptoms as major depression at any other time. Um, that said, there are specific differences that you can look for in your patients who are perinatal. So things like um, maybe she has unrealistic expectations for herself and for the baby. Maybe, as I mentioned before, she's very preoccupied with the baby's safety or vulnerability, um, maybe feeling profoundly negative and unkind toward herself, toward her parenting. Um, and then again, maybe thoughts of death or of hurting the baby. 
Substance use and PMADs are highly comorbid and of course very important to discuss with patients. Um, so I think we know that what I offer for your consideration today is to just think about, you know, how do we help providers who may come into the room with their own biases and personal experiences around substance use. So some providers um, may have a family history of substance use themselves. Maybe they have had pregnant patient experiences that have really colored their views around this. Um, and how can they work around those to be as supportive to parents as possible? Um, there's also this very complex question of how we ensure the safest possible outcome for all involved. Our system is frequently debating the merits of a harm reduction versus an abstinence model in substance use treatment, and that plays a role here in the perinatal population as well. It's um, also important to mention that even patients with the best intentions may not be able to engage in substance use treatment. Uh, Population-based studies show that women who are white um, ethnically of older reproductive age, college educated and have health insurance um, are most likely to be able to receive um, co-occurring mental health and substance use care. So just something to keep in mind as we're thinking about treatment and barriers to treatment. And of course we do a disservice to our patients when we only focus on the birthing person and don't think about how perinatal mood and anxiety disorders impact the whole family. So the partner of someone who has, um, is struggling with PMADS may experience their own feelings of confusion, confusion, anger, fear, and feelings of being overwhelmed. Um, they might have their own symptoms of postpartum depression. Um, their partner may experience them as disconnected or distracted. Um, in fact, one in 10 fathers experience, by our estimation, a mood and anxiety disorder um, during the perinatal period. Um, you know, they're also being impacted by sleep deprivation. They might feel burdened or overwhelmed by the new responsibilities of parenting, and they might feel ignored by their partner um, as this, this new baby has entered the family. So not a lot of work has been done yet identifying the partner's experience, but it's crucial that we keep them in mind um, as we think about ways to support families better. So now we'll transition to talking about um, NC Matters. Our program supports access to mental health care services for pregnant and postpartum patients across the state. Here are the goals of our program, which has been operating since 2019. Our model is based on a model from Massachusetts called MCPAT for Moms, and we are now one of 17 programs across the country. Um, a lot of primary care providers ask, well, okay, you want me to screen my patient for depression, but you know, what if I screen her and there's nowhere to send her? What do I do with that? That doesn't help anybody. Our hope is that NC Matters responds to that question by providing support to both providers and their patients. We do this through two major sets of activities. The first is screening assessment and treatment. So our goal is to um, get perinatal patients screened during and after pregnancy that patients who are screened have timely access to mental health care services. And as I mentioned, that mental health is integrated into whole person care. We do that through provider education and support. Our goals being that providers feel more confident addressing perinatal mental health and substance use, and that OB practices are screening all perinatal patients during pregnancy and postpartum. Here's another way to look at this. Mental health um, is for all of us, and it fits into every part of the pregnancy and postpartum timeline. The anatomy ultrasound, for example, how does mental health fit into that time? That's a significant event. It may carry with it a lot of emotions. Um, so from, from joy to excitement, to stress, to fear, to sadness. Um, and we know that medical care drops off for women after that initial postpartum visit at four to six weeks. So we want to ensure that there is space for patients to get the physical and mental health care they need during that time of transition with their new baby. Here are the three core services we use to help us reach our goals with the program. So education, we, um, we have trainings and toolkits. We offer trainings about North, Carol North Carolina maternal mental health matters as a program, but we also do trainings and presentations in person and online on special topics by request, such as anxiety, attachment, bipolar disorder, medication management. Um, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any specific training needs. Our consultation line is really the engine of our program. It's available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to any healthcare provider with any level of licensure um, in the state of North Carolina. 
it's staffed by a social worker and a perinatal psychiatrist at all times. Um, we work with healthcare providers across a range of professions. So not just prescribers, but doctors, midwives, therapists, psychiatric providers, doulas, lactation consultants. Our goal is to answer questions about treatment, diagnoses, and medications. We will also see patients for a one-time psychiatric assessment at no cost to them via teletherapy that you can request through this consult line. We also offer resource and referral services to patients to connect them to options in their community. So let's look at an example of where the traditional method of screening and referring can go wrong in a system that has limited resources and care pathways, especially for women who are underinsured. So um, imagine that we have a patient, Taylor, and she has screened positive for depression on the EPDS at her 14 week initial prenatal visit. Her OB um, reads her screening tool and is concerned and um, directs the patient to say, call her LME for therapy resources, or perhaps she goes on psychology today and she looks for therapists who take her insurance. And there are a number of reasons why a patient might not connect with a therapist that way. Um, let's say in this case that, you know, nobody calls her back or, or maybe she does get through, but she's put on a wait list. Um, and then she comes back at 24 weeks um, and she's feeling worse could because she never connected with the therapist. Um, maybe in this case, the OB is not comfortable prescribing Zoloft or another medication. Um, so the OB refers Taylor to a psychiatrist in the community. And then again, maybe she goes on a wait list. Maybe she doesn't go. Um, there could be a number of reasons why that connection doesn't happen. Maybe they don't take her insurance. They used to, but they don't anymore. Um, and then at one month postpartum, um, Taylor's feelings um, are getting worse and she engages in self-harm. So then at that point we have an emergency, she's rushed to the emergency room, perhaps she's admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And at this point, um, Taylor and her child are at higher risk of behavioral, developmental and health complications. Um, well, well past this initial incident. So this is just an example. Um, of course, we all do our best and try to get people in quickly, but there are just limitations in our healthcare system. There are not always enough resources to meet the need. And even with our very best efforts, patients often don't connect with care and then um, they get worse. So postpartum depression can lead to hospitalization. It can lead to long-term negative effects for families. Um, we of course care about our patients and that they are getting taken care of. Um, but the way that our system does this is not always effective and it can be expensive, um, especially when patients don't get care early. So um, put another way, you know, how, what would NC Matters look like in your clinic or your place of business? Um, so we just, our goal is to provide support to you. So perhaps you, you see a patient in your clinic and maybe there's a complex mental health history um, and, and you're thinking maybe, you know, this is not what I'm trained to do. I'm trained to deliver babies or I'm trained to, um, keep, you know, mom and baby healthy during this pregnancy, but I'm not trained to manage psychotropic medications. What do I do? Um, so we hope that we, we are the answer, um, in some ways, you know, we all need extra support sometimes in caring for our patients. We hope to provide the space to process together and to work with you to create a team for this patient and, and support her in the way that makes the most sense. So, um, and then on the left here are some of the questions that we ask when you call. Um, you don't have to have all of this information when you call, but these are the kinds of things that we are looking for to try to help you develop a treatment plan for the patient. So this is um, kind of our, our dream scenario for Taylor, um, you know, that NC Matters is a starting point to getting patients the support and the care that they need. So um, maybe at that 14 week um, initial prenatal, the OB calls NC Matters, gets some coaching on starting an antidepressant. Um, we connect Taylor to a therapist um, appropriately and she, she does go to her appointment. She starts her medication, she's connecting with her therapist, and she gets on a path to feeling better before the baby is born and then is a much better, is in a much better position to um, adjust to and enjoy her new baby. Our goal with our program is not to take over care, but to support to the extent possible the um, patient's ability to receive care in her medical home with her team and in her own community. So this is one way that this might happen. Our model would also work well in a practice that already has embedded behavioral health care. Um, and we would, we would want to step in and support you just if you need help caring for someone who's more complex or acute, um, maybe hasn't responded to previous treatment options, that's where we would like to support you. 
We have been running our line since November of 2019. We've served over 460 patients across 46 counties in North Carolina. Just to give you a sense of who's calling the line, um, we're about 50-50 in terms of pregnant versus postpartum patients. About 40% of our calls are on behalf of Medicaid recipients, and about a quarter of our calls are from non-prescribers. So we are, we are happy to work with providers of any type. Um, providers often tell us that they're not sure that they have time to call our line um, when they're so busy managing so many things in a, in a clinical day, but you can see from our satisfaction surveys that they are largely very happy with our services once they take the time to work with us. So 95% of respondents said that they were satisfied or very satisfied with the consultation we offered. 63% um, said they felt more confident treating behavioral health concerns following their consult with NC Matters and 76% felt the consult reduced the patient's immediate need for a higher level of care, such as going to the emergency room or calling mobile crisis. We offer a lot of other resources that you're welcome to access. Um, if you go to AHEC Connect, which is administered by the Greensboro AHEC, you can see our perinatal mental health lecture series where we have free courses for CME on topics related to perinatal mood. You can also sign up for our free newsletter that comes out once a month, and it's a joint newsletter with NCPAL, which is the pediatric consult service that is run through Duke University. Um, we also have our North Carolina Attachment Network. That is a virtual group that will meet six times a year, um, basically on topics around mom-baby interactions and how we can support a healthy dyad from the perinatal and the pediatric perspectives. Um, so we will provide more information on that if you're interested in joining us. And then of course, as I said, we offer trainings and presentations by request on a number of topics, um, whatever is interesting to you or wherever you see a need for more training among your peers. Here's our information, um, which we're also happy to um, provide to you separately if you need it. So you can find us at ncmatters.org. Um, on that website, you can find information about how to sign up for our newsletter that I mentioned. There's a form you can use to enroll in NC Matters if you would like to sign up to use our service. That's very easy. You can also send us a request to get more information about the attachment network through our website. And you're welcome to call the line. So again, it's available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our number is 919-681-2909, extension two. Um, this is also, if you happen to work with a pediatric population, this is the same phone number for NCPAL, which is the North Carolina Pediatric Access Line. So if you have a question about a pediatric patient, you can hit extension one. But if you have a question about a perinatal patient, you can hit extension two. Thank you so much for your time today, and we'll look forward to hearing from you.